Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories, where today, Karen tries to throw her own party at my house, so I kicked her out. My husband's family is having a week-long family reunion in our city, and last night we hosted a dinner party at our house. There were about 40 people there, and it really started at noon since many of the adults came to help prep the house and the food and enjoy being together. For the most part, his family is lovely, and we get along well. The party started at 6, and everyone had a good time. Around 10, everyone started to make their way out. By 11, the food was being put up. Close to midnight, I went to get our son ready for bed while my husband and some of his family were washing the dishes and tidying up the kitchen in the house. A little while after midnight, I heard the doorbell ring and I heard unfamiliar voices and laughter. I went downstairs to discover my 20-something-year-old niece, who was still there, had invited seven of her friends to the party without my permission, and they were just showing up because they left their city late and underestimated the time that it took to get to our place, about seven hours. They strolled into our house with some of them not saying anything to me or the other adults and asked my niece what was for dinner. I tried to shut it down and said that the party was over because it's after midnight. A girl in the group said that they've been driving for so long and she doesn't want to be in their car anymore. Then another girl told my niece, without looking at me, that everything is closed, so if they don't eat now, they won't be able to eat until morning. I pointed out the gas stations are still open when my sister-in-law, niece's mom, told the group she can heat up some food for them. We got into a heated discussion and I told sister-in-law she can leave and feed them at her house. My husband led me upstairs, begged me to just let his sister feed the group and we argued. It was almost two before I could get our toddler to sleep due to the noise and the smell of food coming from downstairs. Today at lunch, another sister-in-law made a passive-aggressive comment about being a good host, so I told her directly that a good guest doesn't bring additional guests. That blew the lid off and we argued loudly. His entire family thinks I'm being unreasonable to a group of tired and hungry kids. My husband thinks it's the stress of having so many people here that I'm overreacting and I should apologize. I refuse to and I feel like I'm on an island by myself. Was I wrong? You're not the jerk and your husband is a massive jerk for not backing you up and for telling you you're overreacting. After niece invited strangers over, the stranger strolled in after the event was over and sister-in-law tried to override OP in their own home. I would be furious. Not the jerk. Your husband seems to have too much in common with his family. Not the jerk. It would be rude to have seven uninvited guests show up at 6 p.m. or 8 p.m. 10 p.m. would be very rude. Midnight is just beyond the pale. My boyfriend got his ex-girlfriend pregnant and I don't know what to do. I don't even know how I got into this mess. I don't have many friends to go to about this, so I decided to come to this sub. Starting from the beginning, I met my current boyfriend, Jared, fake name, back in January last year. We met when I started my new job and we clicked instantly. He's funny, charming, caring, and definitely eye candy. We became super close and we hung out all the time and we would stay up all night talking on the phone for hours. At the time I met Jared, I had just gotten out of a miserable relationship with my ex-boyfriend of two years. That relationship really affected me and I was afraid to get into another relationship, so I didn't act on my feelings for Jared. Jared told me that he was willing to wait for me for as long as I needed. I really appreciated that and I'm so lucky to have met someone like him. Eventually, him and I finally made it official around Christmas time. Our relationship has been amazing and this is the best one I've ever been in. That is, until a few days ago. A few days ago, Jared called me and told me that he was on his way over to my place and that he needed to talk to me about something important. When he arrived, we sat down and he confessed to me that his ex-girlfriend is pregnant and the baby is his. According to him, this is how it happened. He was at the bar with a few of his buddies on Labor Day and he ran into his ex there. Apparently, he was drunk and he started to feel a bit lonely. Him and his ex began talking and flirting. Long story short, they ended up going back to his place. His ex-girlfriend is currently seven months pregnant and up until now, he hasn't told me. He says he kept it from me out of fear that I would leave him and because he wasn't sure if she was being 100% truthful about the pregnancy. This has been on my mind for the past few days and I don't know what to do. Jared has given me space to process all of this, which I appreciate. On one hand, I feel like it isn't fair for me to be upset because him and I weren't together. But on the other hand, it hurts that he didn't tell me this when we first began dating. 
I know them having a baby doesn't necessarily involve me, and of course, the only thing that should matter in this situation is the baby, but I'm not really sure where this leaves me. I'm not sure what to do now or how to go about this. I've always been child-free, and the thought of being a stepmother scares me. Jared is my best friend, and I love and care about him with everything in me. My heart is so confused. Update Before I get into the update, I wanted to clarify some things that a few people have been confused about. 1. Jared and his ex are not secretly together. Before the night that they got together, they hadn't spoken to each other in over a year. Now it seems they don't get along unless they're discussing plans or info about the baby. 2. Ex-girlfriend did know that Jared hadn't told me about the pregnancy. According to him, she would say things like, You need to tell her. Or, Why are you keeping this from her? But she never pushed him on the topic too much. 3. Jared and I began dating on the 21st of December. He got with his ex on Labor Day, early September. He did not cheat on me. Now for the update. After doing a lot of thinking and seeing the advice that I got on my post, I realized that it isn't in my best interest to continue being with him. Having a baby is a huge deal and it would completely shake up our relationship. I wouldn't be able to handle the responsibility of being a stepmother. I also don't feel like I can trust him after he kept this from me for so long. Yesterday, I invited Jared over to my place and I set him down to talk. I told him that I'm disappointed in him for lying and keeping this from me for so long and that I thought he was better than that. Then, I told him that while I do love him, I can't be with him. And he actually cried. It was the first time I've ever seen him cry. Despite what everyone's saying, Jared really is a good guy. He just did something extremely stupid and inconsiderate. By the end of the talk, both of us were in tears. It was a mess. He asked me if we could still keep in contact and possibly remain friends. I said that while I wouldn't mind that, it would take a lot of time, and I told him not to contact me for a while. I wished him good luck with the baby, and that was the end of it. I'm very sad and broken up about this, but I'll be okay soon. I'm planning to go out of town to visit my sister. I haven't even told her about the situation yet. Very soon, so hopefully that'll take my mind off of things. I thank everyone for the advice. It really did help me out. Have a great day. Jared should have told OP as soon as he found out about his ex telling the truth. Keeping a secret for so long about something life-changing like a baby was a big betrayal of trust. Am I the jerk for canceling my stepson's birthday because he facepalmed me? I married my husband two years ago and my relationship with my stepson, who's 12, has never been well. We tried everything, but nothing seems to work. His behavior towards me is so terrible. He shouts at me, says words he shouldn't, and calls me the worst mother ever. His 13th birthday is tomorrow, and since my daughter, who's seven, her birthday is only 10 days apart, we usually celebrate them both on the same day. They're fine with it. I asked my stepson who he has invited, and that's when he face palms, gesture, and tells me that he's already answered this question before, in the worst tone ever. This is where I lost it and told him that because of his attitude, I'm going to cancel his birthday tomorrow. At first, he didn't believe me since it's not the first time I intend to punish him without actually doing it in the end. But this time I was serious, and to prove it, I called his grandparents and I told them his birthday was canceled. He started crying, begging me not to cancel, but I told him it's too late. I got berated by his grandparents because of this and they told me that I don't have the right to cancel his birthday. As his mother, I'm pretty sure I can do what I want though, but they weren't listening to me. They even told me that tomorrow they're coming to his birthday with the gifts even after I told them not to bother because I won't open the door. Am I the jerk here? How long have you been in his life? Where is his father? Where's his biological mother? Does he see you as a mom? Because it seems he doesn't, but he should respect you as a parental figure. You've played soft with him all the time, but most importantly, where's the boy's father? He should be disciplining him. OP. I've been in his life for three years, although the first year I wasn't spending so much time with him. Where's his father? He's a doctor and had to go to another city for a month. Where's biological mother? She's mentally unstable and did not see her kid for almost a year now. Does he see me as a mom? By the way he's acting, no. Unfortunately, he does not. I'm really hurt from what you just said. You know nothing about me. His father is away most of the time and I'm the one taking care of him. I spend more time with his son than both his father and biological mother combined. Yet you dare tell me that I'm a pathetic excuse of a mother. Shame on you. The fact that people are agreeing with what you just said is honestly so sad. You guys really think you know my life story based on this post? You're free to judge me, as I have made this post for that. 
but stop assuming things you don't know. Shame on me? You canceled this kid's birthday because you couldn't remember the names. You canceled his party because of something you did. Canceling his party is a horrible overreaction and that poor kid told you the names. Why didn't you remember them? If you're such a great mother as you call yourself, why couldn't you remember a couple of names? If you wanted to punish him for simply facepalming, that's already bad enough. But canceling the whole birthday party? Shame on you. I wonder if you would have reacted the same if your daughter facepalmed. I think not. OP. If she was also disrespectful before, then yes, I would. I didn't punish my son only for the facepalm. Despite knowing him for only three years, believe it or not, I love them both equally as much. Info. What did his dad say when you told him that you made this decision? OP. He just called me not too long ago and is against it. His birthday party will most likely not get cancelled anymore after the arguments I had with him and my son's grandparents and the judgments that I've had here, but it might have to be postponed due to me not arranging things on time and other issues. I will still take his presents as a punishment and give them back to him once he behaves, and hopefully I'm taking the right actions with this. You really are bad at parenting. OP. I only started parenting him two years ago. Until then, I was parenting my daughter, who still respects me and is overall adorable. I don't think I was the one that failed here. Edit. Alright, I had enough. Starting from now, offensive awards are going to be hidden. Update. A lot of you have asked me for an update, so I decided to go ahead and give you one. Since many of you have called me a jerk, and after the conversation I had with my husband and his parents, I realized that I did indeed overreact, and I shouldn't have made such a harsh punishment. Some of you suggested if his attitude persists, I should find other ways to punish him, like not allowing him on his laptop, let him do some housework, etc., and I will start doing these sorts of punishments if needed. Unfortunately, due to me not contacting his friends on time, his party still didn't happen on his birthday. It was postponed two days later, but my daughter still got to celebrate her birthday on that day. My son was obviously really upset and in the morning he came to me and was on the verge of crying, asking me if I did actually cancel his birthday party. I told him that unfortunately his friends already made plans, but if he behaves, I will still do his birthday two days later. Surprisingly, he was really polite with me these days, probably because he really wanted his birthday party, but I'm really happy to see that he stopped raising his voice at me and stopped with the rude gestures, such as face palming. His grandparents were also really upset with me and they ended up arranging the party for him instead, as they said that I'm too irresponsible. Both birthday parties ended up being successful, and until now, I still haven't had any severe arguments with them, and I'm really happy with the way things are going. Thank you to everyone who sent me DMs to support me and provide me tips, especially the stepmothers who are going through similar problems. Edit. I am extremely disappointed in the way things are turning out in the comments. I wrote this update post because you guys were interested in seeing how things came out to be in the end, and I was more than happy to update you guys, and this is the respect I'm getting back? When writing your comments, please take a moment to think before clicking on that submit button, or else I will no longer be interacting with this thread. You're the jerk. I can imagine that being a step-parent to a preteen is a really big challenge, but from what I've read in your previous post and this one, your focus seems to be on punishing him into behaving without caring to understand where the behavior is coming from. This boy does not need punitive punishment. He needs you to listen and connect with him. Do some reading, listen to some podcasts, change your perspective. OP, I am aware where this behavior is coming from and I can sort of understand him. Unfortunately, he gets little time and attention from his biological mother and father and this obviously affects him emotionally and I've already told my husband this. I'm trying my best to be a mother for him but it's just so difficult with the little support I have for my husband and his parents. I was rear-ended and found the person who did it. On June 18th, I was rear-ended by a gray Dodge Ram. I caught it on my dash cam and the man who did it appeared on the video twice. I got a picture of his insurance card, damage done on both vehicles and license plates. He told me he would like to take care of this out of pocket as he didn't want his insurance rates to rise. I was okay with this. I've done it before with no issues. The next week, I sent my truck in for an estimate. Up until this, we had been texting back and forth with no issues. I emailed him a copy of the estimate and communication stopped. After hearing nothing from him for three days, I called his insurance and filed a claim because I'm not about to be messed around with. They came back the same day telling me he had stopped paying back in March 
and so his insurance had been cancelled. They could not honor the claim. I was furious. I called and texted him relentlessly with no response. He was not going to pay and neither was his insurance, despite his insurance card saying it expired July 1st. I called my insurance and even though I was at no fault, I had to pay $500 for repairs, deductible. I immediately went to the Denver County Court and filed paperwork for small claims, then on to the Sheriff's Department to serve in paperwork. The police were no help. Shocker. The address he provided on his insurance was falsified, and after telling the deputy four times to run his license plates, he finally did. The same address was used to register his vehicle. There was no other way we could find him, and so I was hopeless. I was going to pay for this jerk's damage, and he was going to get away with it. Until this morning. I decided to do a few Google searches for his name, Denver. A rip-off review popped up. A man with the same name had redone a patio and did a crappy job for it. I thought I'd go ahead and call the company. I asked the receptionist for an estimate and consultation to do some yard work and specifically requested jerk. I heard he was great with this kind of stuff. She said he was great at landscaping, so I asked, he's the one who drives the gray Dodge truck, right? She said yes. My heart stopped. That was all I needed. I called the deputy who was attempting to serve him and they're currently on their way to serve the paperwork at his company. I found you, you jerk, and I'm going to make sure you pay me. The court date is August 12th. I'll see you then. Update. To clear up a misconception from last time, I did call the police at the time of the incident, and they would not come out because it was on private property. When I left you guys last time, the police were about to serve his paperwork. I just got off the phone with them. They arrived at the defendant's business address, and no one was at the address. The deputy told me he could try again tomorrow, but I was already not a fan of the way police had acted until this point, so I told him to leave the paperwork at the police station, and I'll take care of it myself. I enlisted a coworker, David, to serve the guy instead. I drove David to the place of business, a two-story, decrepit business complex with gray stonework and 70s-style brown trimming. The defendant's place of business was on the second story, in a darker corner amidst other small businesses. It was extremely quiet and not one of the offices upstairs were occupied. David knocked on the door with no answer. However, there was a mail slot in the middle of the door. We looked through it and saw that the office was about the size of a Mini Cooper with a solitary desk and a Dell PC. Nothing was on and there was no phone. We called the phone number I had tried earlier and no one answered. So we went downstairs hoping to speak to another business owner as to the whereabouts of this guy. For some reason, the empty office gave me a really uncomfortable feeling. On the first floor was a phone repair shop with two sales reps at the counter. David nervously asked one of them if they knew who George Jerk was. The man responded, Are you here to serve him? Dave laughed and asked how he knew that. The man told him that they get people in here every week attempting to serve George. So this dude has been running from people for quite a while. I need to tell you here that Reddit really helped in this investigation. One user told me about Colorado's Secretary of State website. I used it and found another business address for the same company. David and I drove there, but the office space was completely empty. Those were the only two leads I had. I felt defeated and without closure. The last resort I had was a user who offered his private investigative services to me on another thread. I messaged him and within one hour I was on the phone with him giving him every piece of information I had about the defendant. Private investigator told me to give him a few hours and he'd call me back. Sure enough, within an hour, he called and went through the full background on George. Hispanic male, early 40s, he has liens and judgments against him stemming all the way back from 1997. The defendant has been all over Colorado since 97, setting up at least 10 to 12 small businesses, all with multiple P.O. boxes. The addresses were impossible to find and the phone numbers were bunk. One address happened to be a prison in my hometown of Cannon City, Colorado, so we assumed he was a convicted felon. The multiple businesses this man set up was a telltale indicator of money laundering activity. He had filed for bankruptcy twice, but he recently sold a business in 2013 for over $600,000, so he wasn't exactly poor. Unfortunately, despite the full record PI pulled up, there was absolutely nothing new for us to go on. After a few back and forth phone calls from other attempts, I told P.I. that he had done his job and that I had felt a strong sense of peace, knowing that not only have dozens of people attempted this very same thing before to no avail, but that I had exhausted every resource available to me. 
I went back home and relaxed for the next day. 30 minutes later, my phone rings. PI called and told me that he tried another database, one that usually doesn't pull up many results. However, this time an address popped up for a home about 15 minutes north of me in Commerce City. The home is owned by an Asian couple, but the utilities are in the name of the defendant. PI told me that he could do surveillance of the home at an hourly fee, but I told him that I would go by and see if I found anything first. I got in my truck and drove to the address. The home was among an absolutely gorgeous neighborhood surrounding a golf course, each one of them worth $500,000 plus. I rounded the corner for the address and two houses down, the gray Dodge Ram was sitting in the driveway. The license plates matched the photos I took. He was in the house. I drove down to the end of the street and called PI. I needed him served right here, right now, while we still have a chance. I met up with him at a King Supers grocery store about two blocks away, and he went through the game plan. He would park across the street and use his binoculars to spot George. All the PI needed was a visual confirmation and the papers would be served. Both the PI and me carry concealed, so I parked two houses down and stood on the sidewalk as PI pulled across the street. As PI's brakes quietly squeaked as he stopped, George came outside and started loading his truck. He was getting ready to leave somewhere. PI got out of his car and had his cell phone in his shirt pocket, recording the entire exchange. PI asked, Are you Mr. George? No, George replied. Well, does he happen to live here? No, no one by that name lives here. Oh, really? Because I know what you look like, and your plates and vehicle match up to you. Are you profiling me, bro? Dude, don't pull that crap with me. George surprisingly answered, Okay. P.I. gave him the documents. We served the jerk. We got him. We had his address. At this point, he has to either move to another residence or pay the full amount in order to get out of this mess. George and I exchanged looks as he turned to walk back into his house, papers in hand. I gave him a huge smile and I walked back to my truck. The PI and I met around the corner and I left my truck running while I came up to his car to sign the paperwork and pay him for the services rendered. While I was signing, I heard my phone ring through the truck's Bluetooth. I walked back and pick up my phone with the words private number sitting across the screen. My adrenaline shot up and I could feel my eyes dilate. There was absolutely no one else who would call from a private number at this point, so I picked it up while the PI was scrambling to begin recording on his phone. I answered, Hello? A calm, smooth voice replied, What's up, jerk? I answered back with some words that I will not repeat. George threatened, I'm coming to your house tonight, and I'm gonna come up on you. Oh yeah? How do you know where I live? I had intentionally left my address off the copy of his service notice. Doesn't matter. You better watch your back. As I answered back, the phone hung up. The PI wasn't able to record the exchange, but he pointed to my dash cam, the thing that had already been quite useful before. It was running the whole time with audio to go in it. The PI and I parted ways, and on the way back to the house, I called 911, hoping I could get him arrested. I reported the threat he just made. I was shaken, mostly by the tone of voice George had, plus the fact that he had spent time in prison. He had nothing to lose, so why wouldn't he hurt me over $1,000? The police officers were, you guessed it, unhelpful. They told me it wasn't a real threat because they didn't specifically use key words about weapons or anything. So they refused to come out, but I could go in on Monday to request a restraining order. It was Friday night and a piece of paper wasn't going to do much anyway. I went home and did a quick Google search. If you type in my name and zip code, which was on the copy of paperwork George received, my home purchase is public record. The very first result is my address. Great. So I set my home video cameras to record, talked to my neighbors, had my roommate go to her friend's house for the weekend, and I left. I met up with the PI who attempted several times to get the police to come out and at least file a report to no avail. After waiting for a while, I went to my girlfriend's house and stayed there for the weekend, periodically logging into my cameras from my tablet and checking on the house. Fortunately, he didn't show up, and my neighbors didn't report a gray ram driving around the area. I laid low for the next three weeks. My bumper got fixed, and this morning I walked into the courtroom with my pages of pertinent documents, videos, and audio recordings, and I waited. George didn't show up, and the surprisingly very rude judge ruled in my favor by default for a total of $1,067. My next step is to have P.I. go back 
and serve him with the piece of paper which he has to declare his assets, his banking accounts, etc. If he served this document and he does not comply, a bench warrant is issued for his arrest. Throughout this whole time, George hasn't done anything illegal. Technically, Colorado driving laws state that insurance is not required on private property, which the Home Depot parking lot is, so I'm hoping to get these papers served and get a criminal charge against him. If I don't, it's really not a big deal. I got under his skin enough that he had to call and threaten me, and that makes me a happy man. Am I the jerk for telling my father he either had to give me his car until mine was drivable or I was calling the cops on his son? My dad left my mom when I was 12. I love both of them, but when they remarried within a year of the divorce, I knew more than I needed to know. I live close to both my folks and they both have keys to my house in case of emergency. My half-brother, who's 18, still lives with my father and his mother. He seems like a good enough kid, but he is my dad's son, not my brother. I just went on vacation to Brazil for a couple of weeks. When I got back, my car stunk. I almost threw up from the reek. I found a piece of chicken breast rotting in my car. I don't buy raw chicken breast to eat. I hate the way it feels. I buy it prepared and fully cooked. I asked my mom about it and she had no clue. I asked my father and he told me that he borrowed my car, which he is allowed to do, and he used it to get groceries. I told him that he had to pay someone to clean my car. I got a hold of a detailing company, but they said that the smell was in my upholstery and I would probably need to get it replaced. I told my dad and he said that he couldn't afford that. I called my insurance company and asked if I was covered in any way. They said that if my car had been used without my permission, I could report it as stolen and they would cover it. I told my dad and he lost it. He admitted that his son had taken my keys and used my car and that if I reported it stolen, he would get in trouble and it would affect his college admission. I gave my father four choices. Pay to replace the upholstery in my car and guarantee the smell was gone. Buy the car from me at full market value so I could replace it. Give me his car to use until the smell went away or I would report the car as having been stolen. Since the only extra money he has is his son's college fund, he's in a bind. I told him I was taking his car until he decided. I grabbed both sets of keys and left. I also took my emergency key back and changed the locks at my house. His wife has been hounding me because they have to drive around in a stinking car. I told her that I could report it as stolen and have her thief son deal with the consequences. She has had to start taking Ubers everywhere because she can't handle the stench. My dad is close to cracking and using his kid's money to pay for my car. I feel like a jerk and that family thinks I am, but my car was only a year old and I loved it. Not the jerk. Your father and his son created this situation and they lied about it to try and save themselves. Why should you suffer for their stupidity? What was the story with the raw chicken breast? Why was it left in the car? Was it some kind of malicious prank or a bizarre accident? Regardless, it's their problem to fix, and stealing a car, which is what the son did, has consequences. I told my entitled daughter that if she wanted me to raise her baby, then she shouldn't have gotten pregnant. I'm 52, male. My daughter, Amanda, who's 27, and her husband, Chris, who's 25, got married a few months ago. Amanda has lived on her own since college, but still is in the general area. Currently, Amanda and Chris aren't that focused on their future, mostly on having fun and doing things while they're still young. There's nothing wrong with that, in my opinion, and I think that young people should have that kind of period in their life, especially after lockdown. I got a call from Amanda. She and Chris told me how they've taken several tests and confirmed that Amanda is pregnant. They would be hosting announcement dinner, but wanted immediate family to know right away. They could barely wait as they had been trying since they were married. Note that this was an intended pregnancy. I told them I was thrilled to be a grandpa. The dinner party happened last week and the announcement was met with only happiness and excitement. Chris and Amanda were talking to a friend and Chris made a comment along the lines of, good thing that Bobby, me, will while we're at work. I was confused and asked what they were talking about. Amanda revealed that she and Chris were expecting me to always watch the baby while they were working and so they could have fun time while not working. Now I love my kids and will never regret being their dad, but I didn't sign up for a new baby. I'm done with all that. I want to enjoy my retirement and be free without any kids. I explained this to Amanda and Chris, also that there are many great daycare options in the area. Amanda began to cause a scene because, you told me that you were thrilled to be a grandpa. I responded that exactly, I was thrilled to be a grandpa, 
not a parent to this baby. She said that I should help out since I don't have to worry about working. I receive a pension and that she's young and these are supposed to be the best years of her life and she thinks it's unfair that she and Chris' life should be all about a baby. I was very frank and responded that, Amanda, of course you and Chris' life is going to be all about a baby. That's what it means to be a parent. You should not have gotten pregnant if you just expected someone else to raise your kid. Amanda yelled at me. Don't be surprised when I put you in a crappy nursing home. My son, Michael, says that I was harsh in my delivery, but not my message. My son, Nathan, agreed that Amanda and Chris are expecting too much, and it was irresponsible to purposely get pregnant when they believe they don't have time to raise a baby. My sister, Sandra, however, told me my comment was callous, and I haven't raised a newborn in 20 years and don't realize how much harder being a parent has gotten. And I can agree to start providing at least four days of childcare per week, then go from there. Multiple family members are agreeing with Sandra, so I'm looking for some unbiased perspectives on here. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. I have 17 grandbabies and have raised several of them. Helping and raising are two very distinctive different things. Enjoy your grandkid, but do not get wrapped up in the raising of him or her. Trust me, it doesn't stop at four days a week. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist, where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you, based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.